They're counting the votes in Myanmar, but questions swirl about the legitimacy of the election. In Mumbai, US President Obama facing tough questions about terrorism and Pakistan. A live report from India is straight ahead. And he survived more than 60 days trapped underground. Now, one of the Chilean miners crossed the finish line in another test of endurance. His story is coming up. It's 8 a.m. on Monday, November the 8th, overlooking Hong Kong's Victoria Harbour. Welcome to World Report. I'm Anjali Rao. The reclusive nation of Myanmar held its first election in 20 years on Sunday, and now the votes are being counted. But there are widespread fears of fraud. The country's ruling military junta has refused to allow international monitors or foreign journalists in to oversee the elections. We do have contact with a reporter on the ground, but since CNN has not been officially allowed to enter Myanmar, we will not identify the correspondent filing this report. Clearly, Myanmar's rulers don't want the electoral process to be made public. As people in this reclusive country made their way to polling stations for the first time in more than 20 years, very few expected real change. Most predicting a landslide by the USDP, the party supported by the ruling military junta. We don't know who's going to win, but the government supported USDP is the most powerful party. The ruling USDP is the governing party, and this is why we think they are going to win. Security was tight in Yangon, riot police on the streets. While Myanmar television tried to portray the election as a successful act of democracy, observers have called it a sham, a way for the ruling junta and its leader Tan Shui to gain credibility while strengthening their grip on power. The military is guaranteed 25% of the seats in parliament. The party of opposition icon Aung San Suu Kyi boycotted the election and she remains under house arrest. But some opposition groups did participate, though under tight financial and administrative restrictions. The National Democratic Force, the largest opposition movement, lacked the funding to campaign in most areas of the country and was only able to challenge the ruling party in about 15 percent of the more than 1,000 constituencies. And so even many of those who did vote say they realized the process was deeply flawed. I can see like uh, no fear fails. Uh, is supporting a process. We have to monitor, we have to talk about it. It's not fair and fair. The United States and other countries criticized the process. We hope that perhaps out of uh, these elections, some leaders will emerge who know that Burma has to take a different track, that they cannot continue to do the same thing and realize the potential of their people. In many ways, the election was a historic moment for Myanmar. But very few here see a reason to celebrate. Well, let's get more perspective from Mong Zani. He is a research fellow with the London School of Economics and he comes to us live from our Bangkok bureau. Zani, welcome to the show this morning. This was certainly a momentous Thank event uh, for Myanmar, if only because it was the first election held in 20 years. Do you see any impact coming out of it? Well, the impact is very negative because it, you know, it is designed to give the current military dictatorship a veneer of respectability, which uh, ASEAN and Burma's uh, Asian neighbors, such as China and India, want for that country because they don't want to get embarrassed or hounded by uh, Western uh, governments and other entities. But I mean, this is the election that has been denounced as a travesty or a farce. Uh, not just by Western liberal governments, but by ASEAN member states such as uh, for the Philippines and Indonesia. And so I think, you know, the, uh, the, uh, it's fair to say this uh, this election is not going to give the, the regime what it wants, which is credibility and acceptability. The military junta says that this actually marks a transition to democratic rule. And there are other observers who were saying that for all the negative things about it, that it could pave the way for a change of system eventually down the road. Do you see any sort of positives in it? Oh, not at all. I think the changes uh, that, that are happening in terms of 
uh, f uh, the trappings of democracy, like three houses of parliament, uh, you know, uh, so-called uh, new uh, uh, semi-civilian government, they are all at a very superficial level. But the deeper changes that are going to have major consequences for the society and for the environment in the country are uh, happening at the, um, you know, in the form of like so-called privatization. Uh, the, the generals have basically uh, transferred massive state-owned public assets, mines, uh, airports, uh, you know, the uh, uh, timber industries and all of that into their families' hands as well as in the hands of their cronies. So that new class is going to be, uh, be consolidated with the uh, gun-wielding generals. So that's a real change. And, and finally, I think there are three issues that, uh, the, you know, uh, this election and the new uh, uh, so-called civilian government will not be able to address. One is the ethnic relations, which is deteriorating in the country. There is a standoff along the Thai-Burmese border between like ethnic minority groups and the hunter. And second is the ecological crisis uh, that is creating massive dent in the food production uh, in the country. And thirdly, the economic structure of the Burmese economy will not be addressed because the hunter is turning into a deeply uh, kleptocratic turn. President Obama, amongst many others, has denounced this election as being uh, neither free nor fair. Do you think the hunter actually cares what outside voices think, even if they are coming from the most powerful man in the world? Well, I think even if the hunter doesn't care, I think the ASEAN member states do care because, you know, Burma is, is the black sheep of the ASEAN and, and this election puts ASEAN credibility at, at basically at risk. But that's why, you know, Secretary General of ASEAN, people like Surin Pitsuwan, have been, has been bending over backward trying to spin uh, uh, this election as a step in the right direction. But the reality on the ground is, is completely different. And so I think, you know, Burma's... Uh, uh, regime may, may be impervious to international criticism, but I think that uh, Burma's business partners in the ASEAN region who are benefiting from the current situation in Burma and want to benefit more, uh, they, they do care about in international uh, opinion. That's why I think the, uh, that's the context in which the election should be uh, uh, understood. Mongzani, I'm very glad that we were able to uh, get you on with your contribution on this issue. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, President Barack Obama continues his 10-day Asia tour in India, and he has a full schedule today. Mr. Obama will lay a wreath at Rajgat, where Mahatma Gandhi was cremated. Then the president will meet the prime minister, Manmohan Singh, and they'll hold a news conference. Later on, he will address the Indian parliament. And he'll also attend a state dinner that will be in the evening. Mr. Obama spent Sunday taking in some of India's rich architectural heritage, including a 16th century tomb. The stop is part of his 10-day tour of Asia. He also celebrated the holiday of Diwali with some school children in New Delhi. The president later spoke with college students at a town hall meeting where he was asked why the US doesn't consider neighboring Pakistan a terrorist state. Why is Pakistan so important and ally to America so far as America has never called it a terrorist state. So our feeling has been to be honest and forthright with Pakistan, to say we are your friend, this is a problem, and we will help you, but the problem has to be addressed. Well, for more on the president's final day in India, Sarah Sina joins us now live from New Delhi. Sarah.